Even you can understand music. All right, what is up, everybody? We are back for week two. Leg clap. Right off the bat, leg clap. Bad habits die hard, man. Yeah. Right, what is up, everybody? We are back for week two, episode two of Simple Drums Done Well. Thank you so much to everybody for all of the support this first week. Um, getting over 100 subscribers in one week, for me at least, felt awesome. And I'm just really excited to keep going with this content. So thank you so much again. This week we are going to examine Kendrick Scott. This playing is going to be from Live in New York City with Gretchen Parlato. It was recorded at Rockwood Music Hall, one of my favorite venues in the world, in 2012. It was released in 2013, 2012, 2013. And one thing that was really cool about this record is it had two different bands. I think it happened over two nights. Both featured the same pianist in Taylor Ike's who's one of my favorite jazz piano players. He's amazing. The drummer and the bassist were different for each night. So one night the bassist was Alan Hampton and the drummer was Mark Juliana. And the other night the bassist was Bernice Earl Travis and the drummer was Kendrick Scott. We're gonna look at Kendrick Scott and specifically the track Week from Live in New York City. But before we do, a bunch of history. So Kendrick Scott is from Houston. There's something about Houston, Texas where, man, just some of the most incredible jazz musicians or musicians in general in the world came out of Houston. I think part of it is some of that like Southern church, like gospel culture that Dallas has. Also, there's specifically a high school in Houston that I keep hearing about that a lot of these jazz musicians went to. And I think also Erica Badu went to. I know Beyonce is from Houston. I don't know if she went to that high school, but definitely like Robert Glasper, Eric Harlan, Kendrick Scott. Bernice Earl Travis. Chris Daddy Dave, more recently James Francis. There's definitely something in the water down there, something in the culture to explain, who knows, the way that some of these musicians are, are coming up out of Houston. Kendrick has been one of my favorite drummers for probably 10 years as well. He first came on my radar when I saw him in Missoula, Montana with Gretchen Parlato, actually, at a really awesome concert series called Daily Jazz. From there, I think I got one or two of Gretchen's records. Heard a little bit more of his playing there, which was awesome. Living in New York City, I worked at a couple different jazz clubs like Jazz Standard and Village Vanguard and got to see Kendrick a bunch more times as a result and kind of got to see him play it up close. And to my knowledge, one of Kendrick's first gigs was touring with one of my favorite composers and musicians, Terrence Blanchard. I know he was in that band with Derek Hodge and Aaron Parks and Lionel Lueke. So a lot of incredible musicians kind of were mentored. In the way the jazz tradition works, where it seems like the older guys are often bringing up these really young Young, you know, early 20s, 19 year old jazz musicians and kind of showing them the ropes and those people end up in turn doing the same for younger jazz musicians. But I think that mentorship kind of tradition in jazz is really cool. So I kept following Kendrick for a while and then when I moved to New York City in 2013, he was actually back with Terrence Blanchard and recorded on Terrence's record Magnetic, which is a great record, you should check that out for sure. Around the same time he released a record for his solo project called Conviction with his band Oracle. I think it might have been his second uh, record, but it was really the first time I've, I'd listened to Oracle on a regular basis basis and I listened to that record a ton. It was awesome. In 2015, Kendrick Scott Oracle put out We Are The Drum and then just in 2019, another record, A Wall Becomes A Bridge. Kendrick has done some amazingly powerful and poignant videos in light of the social justice issues that have been on everyone's minds this year. He had some really powerful messages that he was able to express and convey through his drumming. Um, so definitely check out his Instagram or his website if you want to see some of that stuff. <laughs> And Kendrick is also currently on the faculty at the Manhattan School of Music as a jazz drum instructor. So dude kind of does it all, let's be honest. So one thing about Kendrick's playing that I've always noticed and admired is his push-pull technique. kind of like molar technique or French finger. These things that you kind of hear about as advanced techniques, but oftentimes get various versions of. For me, this push-pull technique is right in the realm of something that I'm intimidated by and have always been afraid to really practice. I think the reason that it really fits in with being a simple concept is this. Push-pull is, push-pull is primarily, <laughs> 
if we really break down the basis of what push-pull is, I think you could say that it's opening and closing your hand, right? So simply, if we just try, put your hand in a fist, open your fingers, like you're flicking water off the end of your fingers, let's say, okay? The water, my friend. And then you pull your fingers back into your hand. Try and strengthen that a little bit. And then when you go to put the stick in your hand, do the same thing. Now maybe your arm is slightly more involved, but you're holding the stick all the way up in your hand. You extend the stick so it's at the end of your fingers and then pull it back. If you've ever seen like Jojo Mayer play, Jojo of course has this great DVD Secret Weapons for the Modern Drummer. I think that's when the push-pull technique really started to become in the public eye of drummers. If we try this like open-close thing, right? So you open your hand, let the stick come down and bounce back up, close your hand and pull the stick back into your hand. One, two. This is also a technique to use to play great double strokes. Very, very, very strong, big devils. Incredible, amazingly strong devils. One, two. Really strong double strokes that way. So the second double is as loud as the first, but I think we could all try one, two. What I've noticed about Kendrick when he's playing it is there's really no motion in the front of his hand. Very minimal motion. Very, 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 very minimal, minimal. Super, super tiny, tiny, small motion. His arm is moving a little bit. So he's kind of got this like up and down thing with his arm, but it doesn't seem like his thumb or his fingers are really moving that much. Um, so I think that's probably just because Kendrick has practiced this so much. He's really got it distilled down to the exact science of that motion. But if you take that open and close and start to just speed that up a little bit, You can at least get around that tempo, let's say, okay? And I'm by no means super fast with this stuff. But that's the purpose of this episode is we're gonna look at some grooves that Kendrick plays in week and try and make some exercises out of them where we can work on our push-pull with our dominant hand, whatever that is for you, whilst playing some kind of grooves and doing some coordination stuff under it. One of the hardest things I think about doing push-pull stuff is when you're trying to do stuff with your left hand and your feet as well, and the coordination feels much harder than when you're just playing with the push-pull. So a couple quick things before we jump in. The performance of week that they did from Live in NYC is around 128 beats per minute. Um, with a little bit of live music fluctuation, 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 which means that Kendrick is essentially playing 16th notes with one hand at 128 beats per minute, right? So it's like. <laughs> Now, one other quick thing that I did notice in the way that Kendrick was playing it is his arm was always moving at least a little bit. And it kind of seemed like a lot of the motion was almost coming more from his arm, more so than his fingers. Also, like he sits super high at the kit. I feel like his hi-hat is relatively low compared to mine. I tried to lower mine a little bit. And his cymbals are kind of at least, you know, parallel with his head, if not like He's, it feels like he's kind of on top of his kit. So I think that helps a little bit and I might need to adjust my setup a little more. So at 68 beats per minute, our first exercise here is just playing 16th notes on the hi-hat to try and get used to that. So something like... I feel like it's almost probably harder at a slower tempo, but I'm trying to let my arm lead the motion and keep the hand motion pretty small. Um, I also noticed that the angle of Kendrick's arm when he plays the hi-hat is pretty close to his chest, as opposed to like maybe you might think your arm is out, but I noticed his was pretty far in. But then when he goes to play the ride symbol, he does have a kind of a regular distance. Uh, from the side of his body. We're gonna try and add a basic rock beat to this So we're gonna put the bass drum on one and then the snare drum on two, one, two ready, and...
Maybe we added the hi-hat a little bit in there as well, just kind of as a timekeeper. First thing that we need to do, I think, is just try this basic rock beat at a few different tempos. So I know for myself, 108 felt comfortable, but 118 definitely feels like a bit of a stretch. I just don't want to hurt myself. I think I know where my kind of current goal is in terms of stretching that tempo. I will try 128, but at these faster tempos, I'm more likely to try and break these up into smaller groupings. So rather than a continuous flow of 16th notes, maybe doing one or two beats of this push-pull thing um, interspersed with like a jazz ride or a regular eighth note pattern. As you could see, 128 was a gigantic struggle for me. Definitely feeling the burn a little bit in my arm, so I know I need to take it easy. It almost felt like I was able to do it from time to time. It felt easier on the main ride over here to my right. I think part of the reason is the angle of my hands. So naturally on the ride over here, I feel like I have a pretty powerful angle. One thing I kind of noticed from watching Kendrick do it is the angle of his arm would change. So I feel like he's getting into that kind of comfort zone where he can really execute this smoothly on any surface, on any rebounded surface at least I should say. I don't know if I've seen him do it on like a rack tom per se. One other thing real quick is that all the best drummers have pretty good to really great posture. And I think Kendrick has really great posture when he plays. I'm assuming that being able to execute this push-pull technique well, you're required to have good posture and a good kind of physical approach to the drums to begin with. Now what we're going to do is we're going to try some other exercises that are a little more in the vein of what Kendrick plays. Rather than this basic rock beat, he's certainly not doing that. The tune week is actually in 6-4, so we're definitely going to try some stuff that is similar to that. The beat that he plays kind of sounds like a James Brown beat, so there's a large variety of James Brown type beats that I think you could try in 4-4 to try and get used to it still and then try some different variations in six as well. We're gonna go back down to 100 beats per minute for this one because it's more in my current comfort zone. If you are just trying this for the first time and for myself, we should definitely be spending more time at each of the slower tempos with each of these exercises, 68, 73, 78, etc. So here is the first kind of James Brown beat.
All right, so for me, there's really no way I don't think that I can currently do this kind of push-pull stuff in this context at 128. So I'm just gonna try and do some smaller bursts, like two and three beats of that and see if I can keep that going. So 128 is definitely still a struggle for me. I do need to spend a lot more time at the lower tempos to get my muscles strong enough so that I'm not tensing up. Now we're gonna try something that's actually in 6-4 like Weak is. And we're gonna try and keep these hi-hat opens in there but play kind of an actual bar from the phrase. All right, so I can already tell this is actually still a little bit too fast for me. Um, I'm gonna try and play now a four bar phrase from week and I'll have that transcribed for you while I play it. But I'm also gonna slow this down even more cause I don't wanna push myself um, beyond tempos that I'm kind of comfortable and able to execute. One thing to keep in mind and a reminder to cut myself some slack is like when Kendrick improvised this in the moment, right? He was operating based on things he was hearing in the moment and based on things that are physically already within his toolbox. So when I'm trying to learn this thing, it's something that's not comfortable for me. There are things that I could play that would be comfortable, but this particular phrase is not necessarily that. So in some ways it's actually harder, I think, to like recreate this and to uh, read it from a transcription than it would be to improvise it in the moment. What we're trying to get at though is to develop some of these ideas so that they come into our toolbox and that we can use them to improvise at some point. As you up the tempo, you have to be able to hear that fast. I don't think anyone really has trouble, well most drummers at least wouldn't have trouble hearing 16th notes at 128. That's not so hard to hear, it's just really executing this with one hand in a relaxed and smooth flowing manner, right? Back to Jojo Mayer for example, he does talk about human perception with hearing and how musicians need to train to be able to hear faster in order to play that fast. Part of it is physical, but part of it is also mental. One little little trick that I've noticed trying to transcribe things and also just in practicing things if you can't do something you slow it down right but sometimes it's like how are you ever gonna force yourself to get to that faster tempo which isn't always the goal of course but sometimes we want to try and play the faster tempo right or the music requires us to play faster to actually go past the tempo that you need to get to so say I'm trying to get to 128 maybe I try and play it at 140 for a little bit and I just think, this is ridiculous, I'm never gonna do this in the entire time that I'm on this earth. But then I come back down to 128, and it's like, oh, you know what, this doesn't feel so bad. And the same goes for like transcribing things. You know, some people have different opinions on whether or not you should slow down music when you transcribe it. If you slow it down all the time, you're not necessarily working on hearing fast, right? And being able to hear at accurate tempos. Maybe mixing in, slowing it down just occasionally, when you definitely can't hear something, and also, when you're coming back up to tempo because it can sometimes feel overwhelming like oh wow this is really the speed this is at maybe like on youtube for example you can actually make it faster right so you go to like 1.25 tempo try and hear it there and then be like oh gosh that's hard then you come back down to regular tempo and it's like oh you know what that's not so bad so that's just a little way that you can kind of trick your own brain into being able to hear faster last little thing i wanted to talk about little extra credit thing is at around six minutes in the tune week 
Kendrick does this two-handed accenting every four notes kind of thing where I'm not sure if it's maybe more molar than it is push-pull, but it's totally sick and wanted to try that at a slower tempo for sure. And it really builds the intensity at this moment towards the end of the tune. And just a really great example, I think, of like technical virtuosity being able to be employed musically in such a great way to raise up the intensity like that and really bring this moment home. So here's an exercise. Let's start at like 80 BPM for this. Well, thank you so much. I know this was a long video. If there's any chance that you're still here at the end, I'm glad you dug it and thanks so much for checking it out. Also check back later this week. I'll have a full transcription of this section from week and potentially another video just kind of explaining a little further into the philosophy behind this channel. And otherwise, check back next Monday for episode three. Thank you again for coming by. Happy practicing. Come on, the dude can fly, the dude can teach. I can't do either of those things. I wish I could play, I wish I could teach. The dude can play, the dude can teach. What more do you want from the guy? I mean, come on, he's got all, he's got it all. You know what I'm saying? He's a nice, he's a humble person. If you ever talk to him, he's a, he's a humble guy. Ah, come on. Um, talking to a camera, still hard. Still haven't gotten better at that in one week. Here are the exercises. Um, right, but damn. Train of thought, dude. Train of thought. Cool. All right. So again, episode, ooh, kick the camera. <laughs> and to my knowledge, uh, more recently, James Yancey? No, that's a Jay Dilla. Check, 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 check.